So I thought I would start uh, our time together by, by um, asking you a bit of a personal question. Uh, has anybody here ever murdered anybody? And by anybody, I mean another human being. No murderers? <laughs> Come on, you're among friends here. Don't be, sh don't be shy. <laughs> no, there's no murderers here. And as I look out on your compassionate faces, I think I can dare say the reason you've never murdered anybody probably has very little to do with the fact that murder is prohibited in the criminal code and probably has much more to do with the fact that you think murder is wrong and you don't want to live in the kind of society that would tolerate murder. And I venture to think that's probably why you've never knocked over a bank, that's probably why you've never mugged a senior citizen. You think these things are wrong. So law codifies mainstream social values, right? The criminal code still prohibits murder. Law codifies mainstream social values. Now, not all laws are criminal. We have lots of disagreements in our society about what laws should say. So that statement that I've just made is a gross oversimplification, for sure. But I ask you to think about it as a general theme as I continue on tonight. And the second general theme I want to ask you to think about is this. You can't think about law without thinking about how something becomes law. In other words, you can't divorce the subject of law from politics. Law reflects, it preserves, it protects the existing power structure, right? That is to say the segments of society that have the power to get laws passed in the first place and to have them enforced. That is also a gross oversimplification, of course. But as two general themes, law codifies mainstream social values and law serves and preserves existing power structures. These two general thoughts go a really long way to explaining um, the problem with animals in the law. Because whenever you have a problem with animals in the law, and I don't mean people like you who are obviously much more aware of a lot of details that mainstream society may not be aware of, but with the things that actually finally, finally come to light, like puppy mills or the horrors at Marine Land that have been in the press lately, everybody, I assure you, I know for sure, everybody in this room has had somebody say or has said themselves, aren't, aren't there laws against this? <laughs> Can't we use the law to stop this? And the answer to that question, to which I'm going to subject you to the very long-winded <laughs> version tonight, um, can be disappointing. Law reflects mainstream social values. Law serves and preserves existing power structures. But that's not all it does. That's not all it does. There is more to law. Law can be a tool in the box of social change. But it is, to use this trite phrase, one tool in the box. And like any tool, if you really want to make good use of it, you have to be aware of its limitations. And that's, I hope, um, the theme that I can um, share and that I want to try and share uh, some ideas about with you tonight. And given that it's March, um, I thought it might be timely to illustrate the discussion tonight uh, by talking about uh, an event that becomes very significant in this country every March, which is the seal hunt that's going to be starting shortly uh, on the eastern shores of this country. So um, Canada, and I'm going to use notes, pardon me if I'm looking down a little bit, I'm a major digressor and it's for your own sake, so you'll excuse me if I'm looking down a little bit. So um, Canada, and some of this, I just want to say starting in on this, that I realize looking out at you that you will know some of these things, so I hope not to be insulting you by telling you things that you already know. It's just that I'm trying to put the story in a certain context so that it will, I guess, illustrate the point about, about the law that I, that I hope to make. So, so Canada, as, as, as many of you know, conducts the largest commercial slaughter for marine mammals anywhere in the world. Uh, and as you study, you start to realize that in many ways, uh, the story behind the seal hunt, uh, plays out very similarly to our relations with other groups of wildlife in other parts of the country and indeed in other countries. Not just what happens to the seals, right, the violence that we commit against individuals and families and communities, but the justifications for why we do it and the legal context in which these things occur. Because in Ontario, in Newfoundland, in Quebec, in Canada, in all of the jurisdictions in which these horrors occur, we have animal protection legislation. But what we quickly find is that the legislation um, doesn't really 
coincide with the facts of what's happening on the ground as we start to discover them. And so if we look at the seal hunt and if we start to recognize the commonalities with other hunts and other organized slaughters of creatures in our societies, we empower ourselves, I think, I hope, to deconstruct them, to take them on. We've heard it all before. We know how to respond. And then we can start to conceive creative, legal, and other ways of trying to maybe more peacefully coexist. So to do that, I'm going to um, go over a little bit of an old and terrible story that plays out every March and is going to begin in the next few weeks uh, again in Canada. And I'm going to start with a brief overview of the history of the seal hunt. I'm going to then focus on the legal framework, and I'm going to touch on various related issues that have come up over the years and that I think play a part in the continuation of the hunt. And some of this uh, information, um, even though I've been working on this for years and I'm going to tell you about lawsuits that I was involved in around the seal hunt, some of it was news to me. I, I put this story together last year when I was invited to go to Australia for um, a group called Voiceless that wanted a comparison of the Canadian seal hunt and the uh, even bigger, if you can believe it, uh, growing commercial hunt for kangaroos in that country. Most of them are sold for pet food, um, but there I'm tempted to digress again. So. Um, so here, tonight I'm going to focus just on the seals, but uh, if you do want to hear more about kangaroos, we have lots of time for questions after. So to talk about the seal hunt um, and how it unfolded, uh, this particular story begins with a, a wee lesson in property law. So don't get too scared, it's just a very short lesson, and I hope not terribly boring. And it revolves around the name John Locke. And I know some of you in this room will know that name. And the reason... Um, you know that name, is because Locke is the primary architect of the Western theory of property rights. A pretty heavy, well-entrenched theory. And in particular, um, the notion that a property right gives its owner exclusive use and control of an object. And I'm reminding you about this right now because it really goes to the heart of the problem faced by those who are trying to get a better deal for animals. So Locke's ideas about property um, arose out of his desire to find a way to ground a private entitlement to animals and other natural resources. So let me explain what I mean by that. Like Locke, like the people of his times, um, subscribed to the biblical view of creation, right? And the notion that um, human supremacy, man being supreme in particular. And Genesis, um, as you, you might have read, says that the earth and all of its resources were created for the common use of all people. And here became a problem for people who followed biblical teachings. If all of the resources were created for everyone in common, how could any one person make use of a particular resource for herself? By what authority could you do that if everything belongs to everybody? How could you chop down a tree and claim that wood for you if it belonged to the community? Surely God had given us dominion over animals and nature in order that they could be of some use to us. But how do we make use, to them, use of them with this problem? Well, it was necessary to appropriate them in some way, and that's exactly what Locke did. So Locke said, okay, well, our bodies belong to God. No, sorry, we belong to God. We belong to God, but our bodies belong to us. And so does the labor that we make our bodies perform. So if we attach the labor of our bodies to an object in nature, if I use the labor of my body to chop a tree, then I can claim its exclusive use because I've attached my body's labor to it. When a person takes control over an animal in the wild, it's his to keep. So right then, and I really cannot overstate how important this is, at the dawn of the very concept, animals were formally viewed as property. And they acquired that as a legal status, which has not changed very much at all since the 17th century. And in fact, many of the fundamental premises of property law haven't changed since the 17th century, although some significant developments have happened, right? Like some persons who were once thought of as property have fought and acquired their rights. Granted, <laughs> there's still a lot of problems. I would never argue that we have equality, but ostensibly, ostensibly as a goal to which we're striving. Um, we have a different society and it is no longer appropriate or um, uh, lawful in this country to refer to one person as another person's property, although it hasn't always been thus. 
Even inanimate constructs, think about it. Even inanimate constructs, churches, estates, corporations, trusts, ships, even inanimate constructs are legal persons that can go to court and assert their rights. Animals are the only sentient creatures that remain property in law. And since acquiring that status, they've been pretty much, I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, treated like the machines that Descartes said they were, right? Machines that don't think, don't feel, don't communicate, don't have any moral interests of their own, and really don't matter to us in any moral way. And as a result of that thinking, as you know, and as you've been talking about for the last few weeks, the institutional and industrial use of animals has really become ubiquitous, not only in Canada, but in all Western economies. Let me make that point. <laughs> so property laws may not have changed very much since the 17th century, but what has? Science, right? Anybody heard of Darwin? <laughs> remember, the, remember evolution? Well, what did Darwin do? I mean, Darwin really changed everything, didn't he? He unsettled the notions that animals and humans were completely categorically distinct. Right? Th that was the premise on which old laws were based. That's the premise on the formal categorical distinction that we make. But Darwin said that's just not true, right? We are all animals. We vary in degree, but not in kind. And in the many decades since Darwin dared whisper that word, evolution, many branches of science, biology, chemistry, zoology, etymology, go on, genetics most recently, have shown us that we have to transform our understanding of other animals. And those bodies of science have really eroded the categorical lines that were traditionally drawn to distinguish between us and them. It turns out, while well, of course we differ from other animals in some ways, we're also profoundly similar in many. And in particular, the most important one that many of us agree upon is the fact, is the feeling of pain, right? Is sentience, the fact that we feel we feel the effects of what others do to us. So Darwin was right, it turns out. We vary in degree, but not in kind. Other animals do think, they do feel, they do communicate. And as we've started to realize this and have to face it, they have begun to matter to us in moral ways. To wit, all of you here tonight, right, thinking about this. And as we've started to uh, recognize this and, uh, and face this knowledge, we've had to face this question, and we're still struggling with it. What are the morally relevant differences? And I really want to stress morally relevant because as soon as you, and I'm sure everyone in this room has experienced it, as soon as you open up your mouth to advocate on behalf of an animal, the person you're talking to tells you about the differences. Well, they're diff, they're not as smart, they're not as whatever it is. You know, we know there's differences. What are the morally relevant differences between humans and all the other animals that make it okay for us to do to them things that would not be acceptable to do to one another? What are the morally relevant differences? I'm going to leave that hanging as a rhetorical question for the moment, because as we've wrestled with it, personally, I, I've never found a comforting answer to that one, but we'll see where we can get later. As we wrestle with this question, we find a new sense of respect emerging for animals, as we find it's hard to actually come up <laughs> with an answer. And that's happening. Western society is confronting this, I think. I don't know if, if you find the same. It's, it's sure slow, but it seems to be happening. And this recognition is really starting to create pressure um, to re-examine the outdated assumptions on which our laws are based, and then to re-examine, as a result, the actual laws themselves. Because the animal protection laws that we have in place today, in every province and federally, really have their genesis in the 19th century. In fact, our anti-cruelty provisions in the criminal code, while they've been slightly changed, date largely from 1892. So they bring an animal's interests into consideration. And this is not an insignificant advance for merely allocating ownership the way Locke did, right? I can't understate it. it I mean, I shouldn't undervalue it. it. It is a significant difference, but the 19th century was then. We're now in 21. And so those laws and the values that they reflect have proved to be tremendously insufficient for the problems that we're facing today in their terminology, in their assumptions, in their effects. Current animal protection laws still cling to the notion that animals are property 
to be exploited for the benefit of their human owners, even if they purport to regulate the suffering to which animals are going to be put in the course of that exploitation. So I would say modern, modern laws seem superficially to protect animal interests, but as soon as you call on those laws to actually do something, charge a puppy mill owner, do something about marine land, <laughs> you find those laws very quickly come up against and clash this brick wall of property status, which affects how they're interpreted, how they're applied, how many resources are given to the humane society, you know, all these things, all about the property status at the end. So, so when we're having this discussion here today, we're really stuck somewhere in the tension between old ideas and new knowledge, and we're figuring out as a society how to rationalize them and how to adjust. So I want to turn to this Canadian, Canadian, to this very specific and sort of seasonal example of what I mean and talk a little bit about the seal hunt. So every spring, as I'm sure you know, um, the Northwest Atlantic harp seal stops in Canada during their northern migration. And I ask you to think about this because I think a lot of times people step over this and forget seals don't live in Canada. Seals stop in Canada for six to eight weeks during the course of their migration. The longest time they spend here is that, six to eight weeks. All they're doing is stopping to give birth to their babies, nurse their babies, wean their babies, mate, and move on. And then they're off to Greenland to their summer feeding. So they're here for a very, very short time, the precious springtime, when even many people who engage in hunting will tell you, maybe not on the record, but certainly off, this is not the time to be hunting. Spring is the time that you leave wildlife alone so that mothers can raise the next generation so we can shoot them later. But anyway, nevertheless, it's well recognized that spring is not the time to be hunting for babies. And yet that's what we do. Hooded seals, by the way, are also part of this hunt. We hear a lot about the harp seals, but I just wanna say a word about the hooded seals. Um, they come roughly the same time, having their babies right now, February and March. Uh, things are getting a little bit earlier with climate change. They're much less abundant, but they're also part of the commercial slaughter. And there's these incredible creatures. I don't know if you've ever seen photos. They're called hooded because of this hood that comes out of the male's nostril when he's trying to look aggressive. It's, it look, it's like if you ever saw a kid do a really great bubblegum thing, <laughs> this is really... Anyway, they're extraordinary creatures to see. So, uh, so seals and other animals have been killed on Canadian shores and ice flows for centuries. This is nothing new, right? It's been going on for a really long time. And it's important to remember that when we're thinking about trying to change it or, or criticize it or comment on it or, or make um, uh, changes that are going to affect the people who have who've been engaging in it. The large-scale commercial hunt began back in the 19th century in Newfoundland, and we've seen everything out there. Large vessels taking hunters out to the whelping patches. This is how they used to do it. They'd have these huge vessels go right out to the whelping patches where Hundreds of thousands of mothers are, are nursing hundreds of thousands of babies, and that's where the ships would drop the hunters off to start going for the babies. They've used steel-hulled steam liners. They've used airplanes to help them find the herds because it's a huge area that it happens in. Sometimes actually finding the seals can take some time. There's also a smaller hunt that's taken place over the years in Quebec, and that region had a while, for a while, they introduced these trawl lines with large baited hooks, um, and that was a killing method that was actually outlawed in the 1960s. So Quebec continues to have a hunt technically, but the seals have been really hard to find there in the last few years. So the modern controversy about the hunt that I think you guys are probably all familiar with, and the fact that it was really just babies a few days old um, being slaughtered, really came to a head in 1983. And what happened in 1983 was extensive, after extensive lobbying by NGOs, the European Economic Community instituted a two-year ban on the import of products from harp and hooded seals, and then they extended it for another four years. So, with Europe not interested in the fur skins of baby seals, the commercial hunt actually seemed to have ended, and a lot of people, many people I talked to today, actually still do think the hunt ended back in the 80s. But um, what a lot of people don't realize is that in 1996, the Atlantic cod fishery collapsed, and the seal hunt was resurrected. I'll come back to that in a minute. So by 2003, the Canadian government had established a TAC, or a total allowable catch, of 350,000 animals in this six to eight week period, claiming the harp seal population had exploded 
and it absolutely had to be reduced. But beginning in 2009, the number of seals began to decline again, if you can believe it, from 350,000 to 38,000 in 2011. Now, 38,000 is a lot of seals. I am not trying to suggest one is a lot of seals. I'm not trying to, you know, suggest or um, uh, devalue the suffering of 38,000 seals, but you see that it's a much lower number than 350,000. And the second decline also has European origins, because in 2009, after continued NGO lobbying, the EU voted really strongly in favor of a prohibition on the seal product trade entirely. And what this did was it drove pelt prices down, and that became a real disincentive to hunt. But Canada, your government, with your tax dollars, would have none of that. And in 2011, with Norway, uh, it launched a formal dispute at the WTO. And the EU has held its ground. It's resisted. They've appointed a panel. Um, it looks like the dispute is going ahead. Both parties are determined to have it out. The EU is holding firm. So if you want to, if you're in a letter writing mood and you want to write the EU parliamentarians to thank them for holding fast, um, now might be a good time to do it. I want to back up to 2009 though, because it's not only the EU. Um, in 2009, the EU ban came into effect, but you know who else ended a hunt for harp seals? Russia. If you can believe this, Putin finds the seal hunt to be a bloody industry, <laughs> which should have been banned years ago. He should know. So then last year, it got even better. Belarus, Kazakhstan, the Russian Federation banned the import and export of harp seal skins. And more recently, Taiwan has followed. These are big markets. In fact, Russia was receiving, according to the government statistics, up to like 90% of the pelts. So that's a pretty big deal when they decided to, um, to stop taking them. But um, it would obviously be incredibly reckless to say that the hunt is over. It ain't over until it's over. So I want to shift uh, and talk about the legal framework for a moment. I see that that clock continues to say quarter to eight all this time. <laughs> yeah. I try to watch. So... All right, so if it gets boring, you need a break, or just put up your hand and tell me, because I, I think I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm roughly on track, but, but uh, do tell me if, uh, if it's time for a break. So, let, okay, so let's, let's just spend a few minutes thinking about the legal framework. So, as I looked at this issue, um, it turns out there's actually quite a lot of jurisprudence going back to the 19th century on seal hunting. I was really surprised to find that, because as far as I knew, the controversy was from the 80s, right? That's when everybody was opposing the seal hunt. So to find all these 19th century cases was really interesting, until you read them. <laughs> what were these cases all about? Well, the legal dispute in those days was um, between confi conflicting claims between competing sealing vessels. It was a very, very competitive industry in the 19th century. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of boats uh, from, from uh, different parts of the world came to participate. <laughs> and um, the practice at that time, <laughs> it's really hard to, to beat a dog <laughs> in attention. So the practice at that time um, was to trap a bunch of seals on a pan of ice. And um, club them, <laughs> if you could, um, so as to keep them on the ice, ideally killing them, but being in a hurry to club as many as you can as fast as you can so that they were immobilized and then leave that pan of ice and then hurry and get to another pan of ice where there are other seals. It was incredibly competitive. Seals are moving, ice is moving. It's a very fast moving um, industry and always has been. So you immobilize the seals on one pan of ice and move to the next. Well, what happens when you move to the, ex to the next? Pans of ice float away into the path of another vessel who says, great, you know, now we don't have to do the work. They pick up the seals and claim them for their own. So this is what the legal fights were all about. They're mine. No, they're mine. I found them. I killed them. That was the elegance of, um, of seal hunting jurisprudence in the 19th century. So there was never, never any legal issue, never any legal concern in the 19th century regarding whether or how it's justifiable to allocate ownership in individual animals in the first place, a question which, by the way, is emerging in modern animal rights law. No, back then the only question was how to resolve these competing ownership interests. Are they mine or are they mine? But there has been change. There has been progress. In modern times, the interests of animals themselves have begun to receive legal attention. 
and many new legal issues have arisen, but still the old premises remain. I want to say a word about federal fisheries. Has anybody here ever, on a quiet Saturday morning, read the Fisheries Act? <laughs> what? <laughs> so it's long and it's wordy. And, um, and seals are regulated under the Fisheries Act, the Federal Fisheries Act mm -hmm. in Canada. So marine mammals, um, cetaceans, narwhals, walruses, and seals are included in the definition of fish under the Fisheries Act. So it's not entirely unusual, is it, I should say, in the context of industrial animal exploitation to find that we call an animal, um, we label an animal in according to, according to her usefulness to us, right? Waterfowl, broiler, um, vermin, <laughs> pet. You know, we, we name the animal for what it, it does for us. So it's not entirely unusual for this to happen. <clears throat> But I would say that crawling marine mammals fish and calling seal hunting a fishery is rather an antiquated approach in a legal realm that is really supposed to be based and purports to be so heavily based in science. It tells you where the values are and what's important for the people calling the shots. So under the Fisheries Act, there is a set of regulations called the Marine Mammal Regulations. And they contain several offenses comparable to what you see in other hunting legislation. They prohibit, for example, disturbing a marine mammal except when fishing for one. How's that? So if you want to go on the ice, as the government always accuses people of doing, oh, they're out there to end the hunt, they're scaring away the animals. If you go out on the ice to try to um, make noise or, or disturb an animal to scare her away from the approaching hunters, you are violating the regulations. You're only allowed to disturb her if you're going to kill her. That's the animal protection legislation you have. Um, they prohibit attempting to kill a marine mammal except in a manner that is designed to kill the animal quickly. They require a person who kills or wounds a marine mammal to make efforts to retrieve the animal without delay. They prohibit the waste of the edible parts and that sort of thing. So you hear the words I'm emphasizing, right? You gotta try, you gotta make efforts. There shouldn't be delay, but it's undefined. All of these terms have no meaning because they have no precision. They're too vague to carry any weight. There are a few provisions that specifically address seals, and I wanna say a word about these. So to appease the concerns about um, baby seals that killed the European market back in the 80s. The government, of course, um, got creative. And what it did was it prohibited the barter or sale of white coats and bluebacks in 1987. So a white coat is a harp seal that hasn't begun to molt its white coat yet. And a blueback are the hooded seals that haven't molted their blue coats. So, Sounds pretty good, if you don't think about it too much. First of all, the thing to remember is that it's prohibited to barter or sell them. It's not prohibited to kill them. And sealers are allowed to kill up to six seals, or it was, I don't know if it's still six. For many years, they were allowed to kill up to six seals for personal use under their own licenses. But the other more important thing to remember is that white coats begin to molt when the seals are about 10 days old. So at that time, it's lawful under the regulations to kill them. So when the government says, they're too emotional, those bunny huggers are exaggerating, we don't have a hunt for baby seals. They're the ones that are emotional exaggerators because we do have a hunt for 11-day-old seals. And by the way, who's counting the days that these seals have been around and who's on the ice to see if the molt has begun, you know, over these thousands, hundreds of thousands, I think, let me say thousands, that's enough, of square kilometers uh, of ice and rough water. And in the last few years, almost all of the seals reported killed were between three weeks and two months of age. And when I say two months, those numbers are coming out of the NGOs that are involved in this work. And they say two months so as to be careful not to be exaggerating. In fact, the seals aren't even usually there for two months. Once they're born, the babies are, are gone before that time. They gain weight really fast and off they go. So the commercial hunt continued. Um, for white coats and bluebacks, even after it was banned. There's a wee little story that I like to tell because it's so revealing. There was one particular um, guy who had inside information about what was going on at a processing plant. And he put a lot of pressure on the government and he told a lot of people so, so that it basically eventually the government had to do an inspection of this processing plant. And when they got in there, 
1996, there were so many white coat and blueback pelts there right after the ban had been brought into effect that they ended up having to lay a hundred charges, which is quite a lot of charges considering. Well, the sealers, credit to their lawyers, I must say, they fought um, until 2009. So they fought, fought 13 years in a long list of cases, raising every possible defense and argument that they could think of, before finally in 2009, 10 sealers actually were convicted of having these illegal, um, of having illegally killed these, these babies. But what's so interesting to me about this story is that what the sealers, one of the defenses that they tried to use along the way, what they said was something that they had denied all the years when IFA and all the other critics had, had specifically alleged, which is that DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, completely turns its eye or turns its back to the methods of hunting that are, that, that, um, that are being used on the seals. It doesn't care about how the seals are being killed. It's not really even overseeing it. It's understood that it's perfectly fine to do these things and that there's no expectation on these guys to comply with the regulations. And that's exactly what they said as a defense. But DFO always made it clear to us that we never had to follow these regulations. And when IFO was saying, you know, DFO makes it clear, they said, no, those exaggerators, those bunny huggers, they're lying, they're making it up. Yeah. And then they said it as their own defense. And it was rejected. It wasn't accepted as a valid defense. And 10 guys did get convicted. So I want to talk about the manner of killing seals for a moment, if you'll bear with me. Um, is it cruel? And I ask you to think about that word, because the tagline that is so often associated with this hunt is that it's cruel, right? Now, I avoid using the word cruel um, for reasons I'm going to come to in a moment, but um, what do you think? So, and I'm just going to do this for a couple of minutes. Uh, so, so for those of you who haven't already seen the pictures, it's a bit rough. Um, so seals can lawfully be killed by club, by firearm, a rifle or a shotgun, or hack a pick. So a hack a pick is a Norwegian tool, and uh, the modern version has a long handle with an iron head and a curved spike on one end. So one is curved and sharp, and the other is blunt. And until recently, um, the ice flows were extensive on Canadian eastern shores. And so sealers hunted the way I described to you earlier. You find a group of seals, you get on the ice, and you immobilize as many of them as you can, as fast as you can. And they're trying to kill them. You know, I, there's no reason sealers would not want to kill in the first strike. I'm not suggesting that they're trying to prolong agony intentionally, but they're in a hurry. The conditions are extreme. They do one strong hit, whether the animal is dead or unconscious or injured, the animal's immobilized, and then they hurry and move on to another. So um, what's been happening, at least we know as long as we've, we have observers out there to get the footage and to watch it happen, um, is that uh, the seals are not all of killed in the first shot, of course. So they suffer and linger for a long time until the sealers are able to come back and finish them off. And there's a lot of evidence that shows, and I've watched hours of this footage myself because I had to for the lawsuits I was involved in, there's a lot of footage that shows seals being skinned alive. It's not just one year, one bad apple. It's year after year, wherever the observers happen to be. There's a lot of documented cases. They're in a hurry. So because there was this evidence of seals being skinned alive, the government finally had to respond. And what did they do? They brought in the blinking reflex test. They passed a regulation saying that um, after you strike a seal, before you can skin the seal, you do this blinking reflex test. You get down and you touch the eye and you see if the animal blinks, and that's how you know whether or not they're alive or dead. So I probably don't have to explain to you that's not a terribly scientifically precise test. There's no reason to believe it was undertaken with any regularity. But um, it's become irrelevant in recent years because we don't have the blinking reflex test anymore. And why is that? Well, because uh, in recent years with climate change, the hunt has changed because the ice has changed because we don't have those big pans of ice anymore that we used to have. The ice is in tiny little pieces. So the hunters can't get on the big pans of ice to do all this clubbing and striking. So the, the hunt has moved back to vessels. So you're 40 or 50 feet away, right, from this, from the target. So you're on a moving boat. Your, your target is on a moving piece of ice, right? It's freezing. There's, there's gusts of wind. It could be freezing rain. It could be the, the condition, low visibility from fog that Newfoundland is famous for. 
very, very cold temperatures. So what happens when you're trying to take a shot in all of this chaos is that um, many animals are struck and then fall into the water, right? And they can't be retrieved. They drown or they die from their injuries. Um, or sometimes they are shot and then they're retrieved by way of a gaff, which is another implement with a long handle and a very sharp hook at the end. And instead of the blinking reflex test, the regulations now explain that a person must get this, palpate the animal's cranium after the animal's been, sh animal's been shot to confirm that it's been crushed. If the cranium has not been crushed, the sealer must strike the seal's head with a club or hack a pick until it is crushed. It is prohibited to skin a seal until her cranium has been crushed and at least one minute has elapsed after the two auxiliary arteries of the seal located beneath her flippers have been severed. Like, are you kidding? <laughs> are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Even if this is a realistic way of ensuring that an animal is unconscious and scientists dispute it, and even if it is reasonable to think that sealers can and will do it in the conditions I've just described to you, the seal has been shot, pulled from the ice, into the water, through the water, and up into the boat by a sharp implement impaling her face or some other body part. That's the most humane hunt in the world. You've heard your government say that. So um, that's the end of the descriptions. So NGO observers have argued for decades, as long as I can remember, that it's unreasonable to expect that any laws regulating the manner in which these seals are killed can be meaningfully enforced for a bunch of reasons. Boats are widely dispersed, over hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. Um, hundreds of boats are taking part. Conditions are very fast moving, as I've said. They're dangerous, and only a few vessels are overseeing what's going on, and there's a lot of other things for them to be worried about besides humane killing, as you can imagine. And when it comes to the exercise of discretionary powers, we cannot leave aside that sealers, government officials, and the police that are all in this story, all come from the same small, closely knit communities. So the most humane hunt in the world. Have you heard the government say this? You hear it time and time again. You know, why do these emotional bunny hookers, why, what are they complaining about? You know, this is the most humane hunt in the world. I hear it repeatedly. And now that I'm pointing it out, if you haven't seen it already, you will see it this year. So. I would say, I would suggest to you, the only reason they can get away with saying something so absurd is that the word humane has no actual meaning. I invite you to think about it. How would you define it? What does humane mean? It doesn't mean anything at all, right? It's one of those really squishy, sort of airy kind of words that creates an impression, you know, we gave a little needle and the animal went to sleep. <laughs> Whatever it is, it, it gives the impression that everything's fine. When nothing could be further from the truth, it conjures up these really comforting images that have nothing to do with reality. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that I avoid using the word cruelty. And the reason I do that is that for me, the word cruelty connotes a malevolence, right? A malevolent intent that I think is way too high a standard. I think we are setting too high a standard for ourselves when we say the problem is that it's cruel. Cruel, evil, mean, right? It implies there's no purpose. You're just trying to be mean. It implies that the people engaged in it are bad and their reasons for doing it are bad. And that's, that's really not often the case. When you go to these Newfoundland communities at other times of year, you will surely find these to be delightful people, right? It's not evil people who go into research labs every day and do these horrible things to animals. It's not evil people that run the agricultural industry. The things they do are evil, but they're pretty much every day. You know, of course, there's exceptions, and I'm not writing it all off. And, but anyway, all I'm saying is, when we say cruel, we are setting ourselves up to have to prove something that I don't think we should have to prove. It's not that you're trying to be bad. It's not that you're callous about the suffering of the animals. It's just that you're causing this suffering. We don't have to prove that you don't care, right? We should just have to prove that you're doing it. The term cruelty excuses really any harm that has a human purpose, right? It implies just gratuitous harm. So if there's a human purpose, food, I need to do this to an animal so I can eat it, or even sport hunting, 
right? A legitimate human purpose. I need to do this to the animal because I enjoy killing the animal. <laughs> Whatever's the human purpose. It's no longer cruel. We've now stepped out of that box and it's an accepted human practice. So I try to focus on more precise language that actually focuses on the effect on the victim instead of the intent of the actor, right? Violence, violence against animals. It's just a suggestion. So these words, cruel, humane, they appear all the time in animal cruelty legislation. They're in all the animal protection laws. And they operate similarly to the other pithy terminology that you find there. So for example, um, like other jurisdictions, Canadian criminal law generally prohibits causing unnecessary pain, suffering, and injury to an animal. So that sounds pretty good, right? Until you think about it. Because if we have prohibited unnecessary pain and suffering, we have created a corollary, haven't we? And we are now permitted to cause necessary suffering. Well, what's necessary suffering? Well, we write the laws, we interpret them. Suffering is necessary whenever we say it is. That's pretty much, that's pretty much how it works. So, um, the mere use of the word necessary. Hmm. Um. Quick question, is there any common law jurisprudence on the definition of humane or cruelty? Like, just case law? Uh, so there's case law. Um, the, so the question is, is there any case law on cruelty and humane? Um, see, the interesting thing is that the word cruel doesn't actually appear in our, in our criminal code. The heading of the laws is cruelty to animals, but the word cruel doesn't actually appear in the provision. The provision says you can't cause unnecessary pain, suffering, or injury. But you ask a really poignant question because everybody understands these to be cruelty offenses. And I think um, when I'm complaining about all the cases where the violence is so obvious and there's either been no conviction or the sentence is a joke, it's because of this notion of cruelty, unspoken and undefined, you know, that we are picturing some really horrible, evil, malevolent creature and that's not what was happening here. He was just trying to discipline his dog and he got carried away, you know, that sort of thing. So um, if there are any cases that define those terms, they're, they're very few, but largely because of how the words are placed in the legislation, that that's not the test you have to meet. What about other aspects, not necessarily pertaining to animal law, but perhaps humane in the context of treatment of other humans? Yeah, I've looked. That, that's, um, I should have had you last year when I was writing my book. You could have been very helpful because I actually, for purpose of writing this book, I actually did search that. Um, and there's almost nowhere that the word humane comes up. So, but you're onto something, you know, it's a very good idea. Let's look in other contexts and see if we can bring that terminology in. That's a really good point. But where we get stuck is this word unnecessary. So, um, so let me go on just a little bit and see if I can think some more about um, more direct answers to that question. So let me talk about why the word necessary or unnecessary really shows you this very stark categorical distinction that law makes between human owners and animal things. Just that word is enough to tell you this law is going nowhere. So um, what if a person was starving and killed another person for her own survival? Are there any law students in here? Yeah, I should have known. Yeah. <laughs> Dudley and Stevens was a case you might remember from the 19th century where four sailors were stranded. Uh, and after days at sea, when they ran out of food and they ran out of water, two of them plotted to kill a third guy. Uh, and they did. And they ate his flesh. They drank his blood. Uh, and of course, <laughs> unexpectedly, were um, immediately rescued by a passing ship, taken to shore and charged with murder. And they raised the necessity defense. And the reason every first year law student studies this case is because they, they raised this defense. And the necessity defense, which still exists uh, in our legal system, goes something like this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I did something terrible but I did it to prevent something even more terrible from happening. We were all going to die. So we killed him so that at least the two of us could be saved. We had no way of knowing the ship was going to come and get us in the next couple of days. And they, the, the judge and the jury accepted that. They accepted that, um, that the one that, that got killed was the weakest, that he was probably going to die anyways, that there was no reasonable prospect of survival. All of those facts were accepted. But these guys, do you think the defense succeeded? Victorian England? <laughs> Cannibalism? Of course not. If you, you know, were to kill a stranger because you were poor and desperate and starving for your own survival, could you say it's necessary? Or let's think of a less ridiculous example. 
Organ donations. How many people do we hear about waiting on the list who need a healthy organ? Now, what if somebody were to, as they actually do in, in some places, were to kidnap a stranger in the middle of the night and take them to a secret surgical theater and help themselves to one of the person's kidneys? After all, you've still got another one left. When that person was charged, could, could she claim the necessity defense? Never mind court. Could you even say it out loud in public society? Of course not, right? As between legal equals, you don't use the word necessary in that context. It's absurd. It's obscene. But I need your kidney. Well, thank you very much. I need my kidney, right? As between legal equals, we don't use that word. As soon as we start talking about necessity, it was necessary for me to do it. We know there's already a categorical distinction between the two, in, the two parties whose interests we are pretending to weigh. And we know from the outset how that conflict is going to be resolved. My dirty socks don't stand a chance against me in court. I have the rights. I own my dirty socks. I can wash them. I can leave them dirty. Sometimes I use a pen as a, as a visual aid, but I forgot to bring one up here now. But I chew the ends of my pen, and it's very gross. Right? And, and I, sometimes I do it while I'm talking, which is extremely gross. And you could look at me and say, oh, that's gross. you know. Or I could throw my pen and smash it, and you could say, what a fool. Why is she wasting a perfectly good pen? But until I pick up my pen and use it as a weapon against you, it's none of your business what I do with my pen. right? It's my pen. That's what it means to be property. So, the subtleties of language <laughs> disguise harmful human behavior. Law prohibits unnecessary pain, suffering, and injury. The government promises it's humane. And in the absence of any information to the contrary, an otherwise occupied, very busy, mortgage-laden, got to get my kid to soccer, there's a thousand things to do, public, is satisfied. So that's where facts come in. And that's why there is another um, angle to this uh, hunt that I want to turn to in a moment. But first, let me take the question. But excuse me for just one sec. Um, is this water for me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> is there a distinction between the legal and lawful? Is it notice the usable? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. No. Yeah, just two ways of saying the same thing. More or less, yeah. Anybody else while we fight? Can you just repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the question was, uh, is there a difference between legal and lawful? So it's pretty much just two ways of saying the same thing. Isn't that critical, Leslie, when you, you said not equals, when between equals, but you said between equal, not partners, between equal? Legal equals? Legal equals, yeah. So with animals, they're not considered equal. So that's it right there, is it not also? That's it right there. You know, un unless we, you know, let's let's think about equality. So the question is, you know, as soon as animals aren't considered considered equals, isn't that the end of it? Um, and you know, in some ways, yes. But let's, um, while you've invited me on that digression, let's let's think about equality for a moment, right? Um, we have Section 15 in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms that guarantees equality between all citizens, at least uh, between the citizen and, and the government. Um, we have a human rights code that says you shouldn't have discrimination on the basis of race, gender, place of origin, ethnicity, creed, all sorts of things, right? Um, do we have equality in our society? Are we equals? Let's stop there for a second. Are we all equal? No. But you know, we so, as human are. beings, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So mm -hmm. as human beings, we are tall and short. We are smart and less smart. We are nice and less nice, funny, good at math, good at composing operas, some are not so good, some can sing, some can't. We're very different. We're not equal at all in our capacities, in our, um, in our physical being. But we have decided that when it comes to certain fundamentals in respect of our treatment of one another, we are going to treat ourselves and one another as equal. So it's not that there is really quality. It's a decision that we've made, that when it comes to fundamental treatment about basic relations between one another, fundamental rights, like the right to my life, the right not to be used as a means to somebody else's end, those differences don't matter. So what are the differences? And that brings us back to the question, what are the morally relevant differences between humans and other animals that let us draw the line there, right? Everybody's had to fight 
And as humans, we have inherent constituencies, right, of people who are racialized or have a different gender than the one with power. Or, you know, we have inherent communities who can fight. Animals don't have that, right? It's the most altruistic of movements in that sense because nobody stands to gain. And we stand to lose from the convenience and profit that we make from herding animals. So it's a much harder challenge. But philosophically, principally, legally, it's the same argument, right? Why do we draw the line there? So, um, so I'm going to go on. Are we okay to go on? Do you want to take a bit of a break? Okay, I'll go a little bit, but as I say, don't hesitate to wave your hand if you've, if you've had enough. So um, let me say a word about um, the legal action around the seal hunt. So the seal hunt occurs on public land. It's funded by public money. It consumes what, after all, while you and I may disagree, are regarded by most people as public resources. And yet, despite the really wide public interest, observation of the hunt has been a persistent challenge. So the, the regulations that I talked about earlier prohibit anyone from coming within a half nautical mile of a seal fishery without a seal fishery observation license. And the constitutionality of that license has been challenged twice. First, back in 1988, IFA succeeded in establishing that the licenses um, actually contravened observers' right to freedom of expression because they were so vague. And it turned out to be a really important case because it established that the right to freedom of expression that we all have includes the right to gather the information which forms the basis of the expression. It was a really broad media right, and it's a very important case for freedom of expression more generally. It was a big win for IFA. But the government, of course, didn't stop there. What it did was it added some conditions onto the seal fishery observation license, so they, they weren't so vague um, and, uh, and whimsical. And uh, IFA challenged those again 10 years later, just as the government announced what they were going to be. And I won't get too distracted. They, they had to do with um, the distance that the observer had to keep from the hunter, um, which, of course, was a joke because it was the hunter who was trying to breach the distance to get the observer in trouble. They had to do with uh, how wide an area the permit was valid for. It could be only valid for, for one day and you had to keep renewing them, um, which doesn't sound unreasonable until you realize that the hunt happens over this really vast area. So you, you get your permit in the morning, you spend all day looking for the hunt and then you find it and then it's sundown and you've got to fly back and you've seen nothing. And then they say, well, you don't need a permit today. We think you've seen enough. <laughs> so there were all sorts of problems with these conditions that were coming on and IFA challenged them constitutionally again. And I got involved in this case and it was fun, which I say in a very qualified way, there's nothing fun about the seal hunt, but it was so fun from a legal perspective to get to say what you really mean. Because what we argued was that the government was intentionally frustrating the efforts of observers to make meaningful use of their license, specifically because the information that they found and wanted to publicize was contradicting the government's assertions about the hunt. In other words, you're afraid we're going to expose your lie. And it was a really interesting case. It went on for years. It ultimately settled, um, which is sort of a, a boring resolution in the end. You want a big trial with a big victory. Um, uh, but uh, there is one reported case on it for people who are interested in looking that as soon as they announced that they were going to bring in these conditions, I brought a motion for an interim injunction, which basically meant you know, until we can litigate this more fully, can you just give us the injunction now? Because once you deprive us of our, of our, you know, our charter protected right to freedom of expression, we can't be compensated for that. You can't fix that once we've lost it, right? So you weigh the harms. The government wouldn't grant the, uh, the court wouldn't grant the injunction, not because they weren't satisfied about the merits, but because they said this is too big and complicated and it's just not the kind of thing you can resolve on an interim basis. So the, the case did go on, um, for years. And while it did, um, it, there was a lot more media attention because media loves lawsuits. Um, and there was a lot of government attention. The government was clearly aware that it was under a different kind of scrutiny than it had grown accustomed to being under because there were lawyers involved and because there was publicity involved. And, you know, we made demands for documents we wanted them to produce. And now they had to produce them. 
And we had discoveries like the depositions that you see on American news shows. And I asked them questions and they had to answer. You know, like they didn't get to just write you off or with those traditional thank you for your your questions very important. They had to actually answer. So um, and a lot of information was gleaned and contacts were made. And while I can't tell you about the, you know, that there was this big grand result in the end, I can tell you that looking back, I think it played an important part in just the continued pressure from all different angles um, and challenges to this hunt. And observers still go out there to this hunt. Uh, to document it. They, re they regularly go out there to get this photographic and video evidence that shows us the seals being dragged and cut open and still being skinned alive. Um, and charges against sealers are never laid, <laughs> but we know this footage has had an impact in the EU, and we know it's had an impact in Russia, and we know it's had an impact on Taiwan. So kudos to the people who are out there willing to go and get the hard photos. So just to, to finish off talking about this hunt, I want to um, touch on a couple... Oh, sorry. Sorry, you mentioned that seal hunters are never charged. Am I not correct, though, that you require some sort of legal permission to, uh, to, to photograph the hunt, and if, if you don't have permission, you can be charged for being there? Is that not correct? Mm, I'm not aware that you need special permission to photograph. You might, maybe a person's face, but I'm not even sure about that because it is on public land. You need, you need to have a permit to be there. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. You need an observation license to come within a half nautical mile of anybody who's hunting. I'm not sure about a distinction for photographing, but I could be, I could be out of the loop. Maybe that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so the question was about um, whether you need a permit for photography, and we're saying the distinction is between private land and public land. On public land, generally, you can take photos. I will say, however, that the organizations that I know of that are out there taking photos actually don't, um, they go to some trouble to, to blur the person's face, because the point is it's actually not about that guy, right? It's not like you're bad. It's not pointing fingers at one bad apple. It's the act itself. And frankly, the pictures are much more effective with the extra one <laughs> through the person's face anyway. So... I don't, um, I'm, I'm not aware of that having been an issue, but if, if, if there's something more particular to talk about. Um, so just to, to, to explore a couple of the other factors that I'll, I'll play out in the context of this hunt. So there are a lot of things to think about. Why has this hunt perpetuated? Why does it carry on even now when poll after poll says the overwhelming majority of Canadians are opposed to it? Over the years, the hunt has been either promoted or defended as sustainable, as necessary to control seal populations or cod populations. It's economically important. It's culturally important. Native people need it. And the federal government is very concerned about the plight of Aboriginal people in Canada. So, <laughs> so I'm going to touch on a few of these um, because this is how the enforcement of the law, the passage of the law and the enforcement of the law plays out. So fisheries. You know, the story goes that the seas used to be so full of cod that the people would walk in with a bucket and scoop them out, right? And what happened? Word got out how good the cod fishing was off the coast of Canada, and everybody came, right? Vessels came from countries around the world. And for decades leading up to the collapse, there's scientific evidence. This was before science was muzzled in the formal way that our current government is actually doing it. There were decades of um, reports from scientists saying, stop, stop, stop the overfishing, you're, fishing, you're threatening the cod, stop, stop. Because you know how they do it. You've all seen the, right, these massive nets. They just scoop in everything that they can get. And um, the cod are in trouble, the cod are in trouble, the cod are in trouble. Everything's fine. The cod fisheries you know, collapsed in 1996. So what does the government say? The seals did it. That's the first thing they said. The seals ate the fish. I'm not even kidding. You might even remember this. And then everybody had pretty much that reaction. And they said, oh, no, that's not what we meant. It's not that the seals ate all the fish. It's that the seals are impeding the cod recovery. They eat so many, seal they eat so many cod that they're impeding the cod recovery. So, of course, both of these allegations are completely unsupported by science, and they're contraindicated, by the way. You know, governments like to estimate the amount of fish that seals consume, and they come up with this huge number. And that plays well in the media but it really tells us nothing meaningful about the interaction of seals and fish. It tells us nothing about the fact that seals spend just this six to eight weeks in Canadian waters and that cod is a minor part of their diet. 
and that they eat the predators of cod, <laughs> and that the ocean ecosystems are complex, right? You cannot just simply assume that massively removing one major predator, one species, is going to have the direct benefit that you claim on another, cod. The mass killing of seals could have unintended and unpredictable results. Nobody's ever studied them in seals, by the way, but they have in other species and found that, of course, there are unpredictable results when you start playing around with ocean ecosystems. But we still have government representatives saying we have to have mass culls of seals for the cod stock. And the cod fishery, by the way, is back and bigger than the seal fishery. So, uh, I just one point, something mm -hmm. I read, that the reason for that is the government, the current government, is stockpiling furs for a time in the future when the mm -hmm. markets are going to open up again, which mm -hmm. is what they think with pressure, they'll turn it around. So they never stop and they're using any justification they can because they're filling warehouses with the pelts. You're they're exactly right, yeah. Them. That's that's the reason. That's always the reason. I think, you, you, you know, with the wolves, the caribou, whatever, it's mm -hmm. an excuse. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're exactly right and I actually want to say a little bit more about that. So let me come to that in one second because I, I think you're quite right. Um, but before that, let me just say a word, uh, talking about um, ocean ecosystems, I want to talk about population reductions and climate change, because um, the effects of climate change on ice-dependent seals have become a very serious problem. I told you how the fact that uh, the climate is so much warmer now has changed the nature of the hunt, right? We don't have the big ice pans, so now you have to shoot the seals because they're just on these little pieces of ice. Well, not only has climate change affected the hunt, not only are the pans not big enough for the hunters to get on, they're actually not big enough for the seals to get on. So you have all sorts of problems with mothers who can't find ice to give birth to their babies, so the babies are born in the water and drown. Or the ice is so small that it's breaking up and crushing the babies just as they're learning how to swim. Or that it's too far away as the babies are learning to swim, so they can't go from, from piece to piece and they drown before they can find a place to rest. So. Um, in 2010 and 2011, the estimate is that about 80% of the harp seals born in the Gulf of St. Lawrence are thought to have died due to lack of ice before the hunt even began. And the reproductive rates have also dropped dramatically. 2012, of course, I don't have the numbers, but we know it was even warmer. So, and then you've got other things, right? Like seals are still being caught as bycatch in other fisheries. They're still getting hunted when they go up to Greenland. Um, so there's all sorts of population problems that aren't going to show up for five or six years until the population surveys um, don't find the babies that they should have been having. So um, still, uh, the government is setting the total, total allowable catch in the last few years at 400,000. Uh, they've yet to announce the number for this year. That should be the end of this month. So um, let me have a, a very brief digression. I'm coming to the end here, but with your indulgence, I'd like to have a little bit of a brief digression and say something about wildlife management. Um, we must increase the population. We must decrease the population. And we hear this all the time. We have to increase the population. Why? Well, we want to enhance trapping opportunities or hunting opportunities, or sometimes we're willing to say it's an endangered species. Most of the time we're talking about reducing a population, right? to increase hunting and trapping opportunities. For example, the, the tar sands is a great example of that, right? There's been criticism now about how the tar sands are, uh, are really destructive of the caribou, right? The caribou are losing their turf because of the expanding tar sands. I refuse to call them oil sands. And what is the government's answer to that? Shall we stop expanding the tar sands? That, of course, is heresy. What should we do? We're going to shoot more wolves. Why? Because wolves are another threat to the caribou. They shoot wolves all the time so that there's more caribou for people to hunt. So anyway, so we reduce, po or sometimes we reduce populations because they're bothering us in some way. They're on our lawns, they're pooping in our backyard, they're eating our cabbage, whatever it may be. So what's really important to recall in the seal hunt or in the context of any of the other wildlife management initiatives that we're facing is that wildlife management is not a science. <laughs> it is not a science. It is driven by largely political objectives, meaning that its goal is to manipulate a population, or sorry, manipulate a population to the level that some humans would prefer, as opposed to letting nature take its course and, and self-regulate. 
So the term overpopulation that we hear so repeatedly, the seals have overpopulated, the population has exploded. Oh, oops, now they're threatened. How did that happen overnight? The term overpopulation reflects a subjective, value-driven human preference. We count populations based on the methods that we've been developing for the last few decades. And based on those, we say, oh, now there's too few or there's too many. We don't look for the dramatic rise and fall that happens in populations over millennia, over long periods of time, before we had departments of wildlife management to be counting. We don't take account of, indi of indigenous knowledge that confirms that. We don't account for the persistent failure of traditional methods of population control, by which I mean killing, not culling, a term that sanitizes it and makes it sounds all scientific, um, and has no scientific basis. Wild populations are affected by many complex interacting factors, right, as we know, and these are things that can come up in the litigation that you have to be able, when you're talking about law and laws uh, and enforcement and, and legal action, to account for all the surrounding circumstances. So, um, when a significant percentage of a given wildlife population is removed from a particular environment in which it's been succeeding, what does that do? It reduces competition among survivors for existing resources. So what does that do? Since there's more food and there's more shelter to go around, when you take efforts to try and reduce the population, you find that it can often have the opposite effect and not only not reduce the population, but increase the population as a result. Some people call this process comp compensatory mortality. And it explains why all these attempts often fail and are counterproductive. Because when there's compensatory mortality, healthy animals produce more young, right? There's lots of food to go around. Now, hey guys, here's a great spot. There's more food to go around, there's more shelter, there's more of everything they need. Um, and the only real way, or I shouldn't say the only way, but a, a very successful way of avoiding this is to kill so many of the animals that you actually threaten the population, and then it's in danger of disappearing altogether, which is, of course, the risk that's facing the seals right now. You're pushing it to the point from which it can't recover. A more modern approach, I would suggest, recognizes that species become abundant for a whole suite of factors, which include, of course, human manipulation of their environment and the human factors um, that we know that affect them, and the anthropology pathogenic changes um, that, that affect their overall adaptability. So if we really want to affect populations, maybe we need to be directing some effort towards understanding the role we play in affecting wildlife populations in the first place and trying to control our behavior. So um, modern politics isn't really interested in hearing about that. Our government isn't really interested in hearing about environmental problems or moral problems or animal welfare problems. What they care about is money. Um, and so the market for seal products that you were talking about, Gwen, is, of course, where it's all at. Um, other than the fur of the white coats um, that was so important for so many years, there really hasn't been much of a market for seal products. You know, for a while, nobody ever wants the meat. The government has tried to find a market for seal jerky, seal pepperoni. They eat it in Newfoundland, but beyond there, nobody will eat it. You know, for a while, they were selling the carcasses to mink farms um, in, in maritime provinces, if you can imagine, like, how, just, just multiplying the, the, the vulgarity, you know, you, to kill these seals and then to feed them to these animals in these cages, um, until the mink started getting sick and they attributed it to the seal meat and they had to stop doing that. Um, for a few years in the late 90s, there was, um, a market exclusively for, uh, for the seal penis because it was sold as, uh, as an aphrodisiac. And, um, when they started to revive the hunt in the late 90s, in fact, that's what really drove it. Uh, government denied it. And we actually started an interesting lawsuit at the same time as the last one that I told you about, where we accused the government of, um, of dealing in a regulated substance because it was prohibited to deal in testosterone. Um, it's, it, and, uh, and that case got a little bit of attention and then settled. The practice waned suddenly um, and, uh, and the case settled. So, um, but the government is still trying very hard. China doesn't want the meat because they're not satisfied that it's clean enough because seals are regulated as fish and not as meat. So seals don't have the extensive regulatory system that our meat system does. Um, and so, uh, so China's been saying no so far. And China's also a big player for kangaroos. They're also turning down the kangaroo meat. It's very interesting. Everybody thinks we can sell there and, and, and China doesn't want them. 
So, as you say, the media accounts are saying there are up to 400,000 um, pelts being stockpiled. <coughs> Excuse me. And the government is encouraging guys to continue to stockpile them because they're just adamant that they're not going to let this hunt go. They're going to keep going. But in the meantime, you know, seal hunting is, it's awful. You know, the, I don't believe the guys like doing it. It's dangerous. It's filthy. It's cold. It's expensive. It ruins your boat. Very few people make money at it. There's a, there's a handful of old Newfoundland families that own the big boats. There's a handful of processors. But most of the guys on the ground, like in any other industry, doing all the dirty work, don't make very much money. Um, and, and it's horrible, horrible work. And I don't think anybody wants to do it. But I also don't think anybody likes the feeling that outsiders are coming into their community saying, you're bad, you know, you can't do this. Um, and so we see just this ongoing conflict that just won't give way. But the market, the price of pelts has gone way down since the EU ban, um, and and uh, and it's really hard to find somewhere to sell them at the moment. So it's an interesting time. So um, uh, one word, uh, one word I, I want to point out: when you criticize the seal hunt, you often find the hunters say um, it's not very pretty in a slaughterhouse either. I don't know if you. Heard that. I hear that a lot around the work around the seal hunt. Oh, you're criticizing us? Well, our abattoir is out in the open. You know, if you would see those other slaughterhouses, they're even worse. You know, it's amazing how they deny everything their critics say until they say, you know, until it helps them, right? Those slaughter, those slaughter, it's fine, it's perfectly humane. Those slaughterhouses are even worse. So, so that's what they say. Well, yeah, you know, the slaughterhouses are, are, are not pretty either. And of course they're right. Slaughterhouses aren't pretty either, but I would suggest it's a very twisted moral theory that works this way. Well, you know, you can't criticize what I'm doing because of what that guy's doing, right? But this happens again and again in the context of animals. It's a strategy that's been very successful only because we don't think through or require others to think through the absurdity of the logic, right? Just because we can't fix all the problems right now, that means we have no right to fix any of them. You know, that's absurd. Just because we can't do everything, therefore, we must do nothing. We can't criticize sexism. There's racism. I mean, in the human context, that just seems ridiculous. It seems understood that just because I can only say one thing at a time, that doesn't mean there aren't other problems that I'm happy to talk about later. And by the way, they're all related in the end anyways. So, um, the last point on that. So, um, let me, let me come to an end. Um, there's more to talk about, but we can go on forever about the seal hunt. So let me just conclude by saying, you know, all of these themes, there's more to talk about how Aboriginal people are completely used by the government when it comes to seal hunt politics, how the only reason the hunt carries on is because there's seven federal seats that no government has the nerve to, to, uh, to expose. Lots, lots of things you can say, and all of these are a factor. You know, why has the hunt continued? How are we going to try and bring it to an end? And law plays a role. Right? Law plays a role there. I seem to forget. I go on sometimes and forget, oh yeah, this is a law talk. What are we talking about here? So many seals. So um, all of these themes are at play, not only when we're talking about seals, but when we want to stop other kinds of massive hunts. Snow geese, cormorants, look what they're doing to moose in Newfoundland, black bear, coyotes, here, all of those Canada goose coats. How many coyotes are anally electrocuted for one Canada goose coat? The wolves that are forever shot. Every issue has its own subtleties, but the same range of arguments we see is always being made to why, not only why we can, but we must kill them. We must kill them. And they all rest on the same assumption, assumptions. All the other species exist just for human purposes. Any human interest necessarily trumps any animal interest. We can and we should regulate others' populations. Think about that, right? The only species that is systemically destroying the biological basis of its own existence. <laughs> and we want to regulate other populations. And these assumptions are increasingly rejected right, by a new generation of people, many of whom are in this room, some of them <laughs> are in this room, are being rejected for scientific, for environmental, and ethical reasons. These things don't fly the way they used to. And I say that as we expose the old assumptions in our current approaches to wildlife, we begin to chip away at the species barrier, this line we draw between us and them. We seek um, to have seals and other animals regarded not just as populations to be managed, but as individuals with lives we should respect. We acknowledge there are legitimate conflicts and concerns, 
between humans and non-humans. I mean, there's so many conflicts just between human animals. There's, there'd be no need for laws without them. But we find ways of peacefully resolving them. We don't just take to murdering each other in the street. And law is important. It's not everything, but it's a tool in the box. It's important to understanding the limitations so that when the government lies and says it's the most humane hunt in the world, it's not cruel, you are empowered to explain why that's not true. We are all empowered to explain it. And we can assert the rights that do exist. And I'll close on this. As humans, we do have rights. We have rights to free expression. We have rights to collect information. We have rights to talk about these things and rights to challenge, to observe, to object, to facilitate debate and discussion like we're doing here tonight. So I'll end on that note and just thank you very much for your attention.